The Chessmen of Doom by John Belairs, Chapter 2. Johnny was startled by this suggestion. School would be out soon, and he thought he would be spending the summer with his friend Byron Ferguson, whom he called Fergie. They would play tetherball and ping pong and softball and chess. In the evenings, they would go to movies or sit on the Dixon's front porch and drink lemonade and listen to spooky shows on the radio. Now the professor was giving him a chance to do something different, and his curiosity was aroused. But Johnny had a timid side, a very large one, and a hundred questions and doubts came crowding into his mind. Professor, he asked in a hesitant voice, did, didn't you say that you couldn't take anyone with you to help keep up the estate this summer? The professor smiled slyly. I can't take any paid help. The will is quite specific about that, but I'm not going to pay you boys. No, indeed. You're going to do things for free if you feel like doing anything at all. And if the grass heads grow through, and if the grass heads grow high on Perry's estate this summer, I will not care one teensy little bit. Do you think we can rope Byron into this trip? Johnny nodded enthusiastically. He and his friend Fergie were practically inseparable, and he would have been unhappy to go on a trip without him. He was sure that he could persuade him to come along. As the last days of May sped past, plans for the trip were put in order. Johnny's grandparents and Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson liked the professor and trusted him, and they were pleased to have the boys traveling under his care. The boys were excited about the trip, and since they had heard that there was a lot of wilderness around Perry's estate, they got together their camping equipment and aired out their sleeping bags. At the Merrimack Sporting Goods Shop, the professor bought a Coleman lamp, an outdoor cook stove, and an enormous pyramid-shaped tent with mosquito net windows and a front porch that could be propped up on poles. The boys got giggly whenever they thought about camping out with the professor, because they were sure he would be the world's worst outdoorsman. But when he lectured them about whittling tent stakes and making a fire with flint and steel, they always remained very sober-faced and grave. Secretly, Fergie and Johnny planned to bring along plenty of matches and some nice, smooth, factory-made tent stakes from Sears and Roebuck. At the end of the second week of June, the professor and his two friends were ready to go. They climbed into the old, battered maroon Pontiac and headed north. They sped along U.S. Route 1 through New Hampshire and on up into Maine. They passed through Portland and then turned onto a gravel road that wound up into the backcountry wilderness of northern Maine. For a long time, the scenery was not all that terrific. Just a lot of medium-sized pine trees growing in sandy soil. But then they saw the humped shape of the Rangeley Mountains and the sunlight glittering on the waters of Lake Moose Lickamaguntic. Ah, wilderness, said the professor, waving his hand grandly. Isn't this beautiful? The boys nodded and tried to make appreciative noises. Actually, they were wondering if Perry Childermass's mansion had lights and running water and a refrigerator. Like most young boys, they liked camping out, but they wanted the comforts of home when they got sick of roughing it. The gravel road took them into Stone, Ar into Stone Arabia, a small town with one movie theater, two gas stations, a church, and a general store, and not much else. The professor stopped at a gulf station to get gas and directions to Perry's estate. Then he drove over a bumpy, tarred road and around endless twists and turns. At one bend, they almost got run off the road by a teenager in a pickup truck who was careening along at high speed and playing his radio at an ear-splitting volume. Young idiot, growled the professor as he went peeling around the next curve. They ought to take away his license and distributor cap and the distributor cap on his engine. Johnny and Fergie looked at each other and smirked. They knew what a terror the professor could be when he got behind the wheel. And they had always thought it was funny that he didn't have the faintest idea of what a lousy driver he was. Uh, Prof? asked Fergie after a while. How far is it to this place of your brother's? I need a bathroom, and then I think we all ought to go to some burger joint and eat. The professor pursed his lips. You should learn patience, Byron. It is a very great virtue, but to answer your question, it shouldn't be too far. We just passed an old barn with a mail pouch chewing tobacco ad on it, and I remember that it was there when I visited Fergie about four, when I visited Perry about 14 years ago. The barn was not far from the entrance to, aha, see, there it is up ahead. Fergie and Johnny looked, and sure enough, at the top of the next hill, they saw two cement gate posts. As they got closer, they saw that the gate posts were covered with seashells, which must have been stuck into the cement when it was still wet. Two rusty iron gates closed off the driveway that led to the mansion, and they were fastened by a chain and a padlock. 
bolted to one gatepost was a greenish bronze plate that said Childermass. The professor pulled up in front of the, the gates and shut off the car's engine. After a little fumbling in his jacket pocket, he came up with a small key that he used to undo the padlock. The gates squealed loudly as he shoved them apart, and a few startled birds rose out of the overgrown shrubbery that grew nearby. With an, old little, with an odd little half-smile on his face, the professor walked back to the car, got in, and started the engine. They drove up the bumpy, twisting driveway. Behind the wall of bushes, they could see statues and obelisks. My brother liked decorations, said the professor with a quiet chuckle. <laughs> Every few years, he would take a trip to Europe and return with the worst collection of junk that you could imagine. A Greek god statue or a Roman emperor. He would buy it and have it shipped back to his estate. The stuff is not only ugly, it's absolutely worthless. The car jolted on. At last, the boys and the professor saw the mansion, a big rectangular stone building with a fancy balustrade along the top. A tall tower capped by a greenish copper roof stood at one corner. In the distance, a wildly overgrown flower garden could be seen. And to the left of the house stood a dignified stone tomb. The air was still and the whole place looked, lord, looked, looked lonely and deserted. So here we are, the professor as he climbed out of the car with a sad little shake of his head and looked around and then walked quickly toward the tomb. Whoops. So here we are, said the professor, as he climbed out of the car with a sad little shake of his head. He looked around and then walked quickly toward the tomb. The boys followed him. The massive bronze doors of the tomb were flanked by two Grecian columns, and the Childermass name was chiseled on the cornice. A few feet from the entrance stood a wide marble statue, stood a white marble statue of a bearded man in old-fashioned formal dress. He held a top hat and gloves in one hand, and with his other hand he pointed at the tomb. On the base of the statue was carved one Latin word, Resurgum. The professor stopped in front of the statue. He looked up and down and si he looked it up and down and sighed. Then he fished a cigarette out of the box in his jacket pocket and lit it. In case you were wondering, boys, he said as he smoked, this is Perry, or rather a pretty good likeness of him, and the Latin word means I shall rise again. Perry planned the statue and the tomb because he had the odd idea that they would help him communicate with the living after he was gone. He really believed that the dead can revisit the earth and talk to the living. He laughed uncomfortably, then he added, <laughs> I suppose we'll find out if Perry's theories are correct if we stay around here very long. Johnny glanced quickly off into the shrubbery. He didn't know what kind of person Perry Childermass had been, but he did not want to meet his ghost. Fergie smirked when he saw Johnny's nervousness. He was a no-nonsense type who always thought that weird events could be explained scientifically. Johnny noticed Fergie's grin, and he immediately got upset. Ah, oh, come on, Fergie, he said irritably. If you saw a ghost, you'd have the same reaction I would. Fergie gazed steadily at his friend. Maybe I would, John, baby, and maybe I wouldn't. But I'll tell you one thing. Oh, gentlemen, please stop, exclaimed the professor, cutting him off. It is much too hot a day for a senseless argument about spooks and specters. Why don't the two of you help me drag our luggage indoors, and then we'll go hunt up that burger joint that Fergie saw on the way here. Ghosts are one thing, but tummy rumbles are quite another, and I am starved. The boys grinned and followed the professor out to the car. It took three trips, but finally, they had the bedrolls and the tent and the Coleman lamp and everything else piled up in the front hallway of the old mansion. The hall smelled musty, and all the pictures and furniture were covered with a thick, furry layer of dust. Johnny and Fergie peered into one or two of the rooms that opened off the hall, and they had that shut-up smell, smell too. And the furniture in them was covered with sheets. As the professor had said on his way up, it would take a bit of work to make this old dump livable again. Oh well, that could all be done tomorrow. Eagerly, the boys followed the professor out to the car, and they drove back to Stone Arabia and gorged on chili burgers and fries. Big Ed Steakhouse. As they drove home, the weather began to change. The air got chilly and dark clouds rushed in to cover the sky. When the three travelers got back to the old mansion, the place looked more grim and forlorn than ever. The gloom descended on them. Frantically, the professor searched his mind for something that would be fun to do, and then he remembered a part of the estate he hadn't thought about in years. Come on, boys, he said as he sprang out of the car. I want to show you something. Fergie and Johnny followed the professor down some stone steps and through a weedy garden to a place where the ground dropped away suddenly. 
A brick retaining wall marked the end of the garden, and beyond it lay a long sloping lawn that looked like the, far, like the fairway on a golf course. At the far end of the lawn, a tall red granite column rose into the sky. It seemed to be topped by a statue, but at this distance it was hard to tell. Fergie and Johnny rushed to the wall to stare. Get a load of that, exclaimed Fergie in amazement. What is it? Oh, that is just one of the lovely ornaments that my wacky brother added to his wonderful estate, said the professor with a careless shrug. It is a column in honor of General Nicholas Herkimer, who won the battle of, Orsk of Orskany in the year 1777. He had a bunch of ragtag militiamen beat the British redcoats, led by Colonel Barry St. Ledger, the battle took place in the Mohawk Valley, which is many hundreds of miles from here, and please don't ask me why my dear brother is so interested in General Herkimer. He just was, that's all. The column is 300 feet high, and you actually can walk it up inside of it. Come on, let's go have a closer look. The boys followed the professor along the brick wall to a place where a long concrete staircase descended to the grassy plain below. They walked down the steps, and then started the long trek toward the column. The afternoon sun had broken through the gray clouds that were piling up in the sky, and long shafts of reddish light fell across the grass. On they plodded till finally they stood at the base of a column. A bolt-studded iron door was set into the stonework, and it appeared to be locked, but the professor had a key. After he had shoved the groaning door inward, the three of them began to climb the endless spiraling stair the flinty steps wound up and up, and the air inside the column was stifling and hot. Finally, after an exhausting trek, the climbers saw light shining through a narrow slit in the stone. After a few more steps, they were out on the round platform at the top of the column. Above them towered the pigeon streaked statue of General Herkimer, who brandished his sword bravely and waved his imaginary troops onward. They looked out at the vast rolling landscape. Behind them lay the mansion, and to the right was a small part of Lake Umbagog. The late sunlight strained the water orange, stained the water orange, and a small domed building stood on a wooden cliff overlooking the lake. What's, hey, what's that? Fergie asked as he pointed. Is it a temple or something? The professor smiled and shook his head. No, Byron, that's another of the odd little surprises that this, that this estate contains. It is an observatory. My charming brother got interested in astronomy about 20 years ago, so he built that domed thingamajig and equipped it with a large telescope. He used to go up there and study the, to study the stars and look for comets, but one night, believe it or not, a falling meteorite hit the telescope's lens and shattered it. Well, my brother took that as a sign from heaven that he ought to stop messing around with astronomy, so he closed up the observatory and padlocked it. And as far as I know, no one's been in there in the last 10 years. Johnny looked puzzled. Professor, he said hesitantly, that part about the meteorite being a sign from heaven, it, it might be true. You know, I mean, what are the chances of something like that happening just by accident? Pretty darn small, said the professor, as he drummed his fingers on the balcony's rusty rail. However, I wouldn't jump to conclusions if I were you. That meteorite may have been someone with a twenty-two rifle. Anyway, I'll take you and Fergie over there sometime. The place has probably gone to ruin, but it might be worth exploring. He paused and yawned hugely. As for myself, he said sleepily, I feel like going back to the old manse for a little rest. It's been a long, hard day of driving, and these old bones ain't what they used to be. Perry had a TV set installed a few years ago, and there are some nice, comfortable chairs in the study. Why don't we go back and collapse? And we'll pause there.